McLaren Formula One is a dynasty. The second oldest active Formula One team on the grid has eight constructors titles to its name and has guided its drivers to 12 championships along the way too. The likes of Hunt, Lauda, Prost and Senna, literally legends of the sport. So why after a couple of races in 2023 have they become the laughing stock of the Formula One grid and why do they now sit bottom of the constructor standings? Recently it hasn't been going great. Flashback to the start of the 2015 season, the team breaks up with Mercedes engines, shifts to Honda, and in the inaugural race of the season in Australia, Jensen Button finishes in 11th place. Doesn't sound that bad, right? Does it sound worse when I remind you that only 11 cars finished that race and Button was lapped twice by the leaders? Suddenly 11th place doesn't sound so nice anymore, does it? And this era at McLaren started as it meant to go on. I would argue that 2015 to 2017, the Honda McLaren era was nothing but embarrassing. The team boss, Eric Boulier, described their performance between 2015 and 17 as a proper disaster for the team's credibility. And I think he put it lightly. The billion dollar question was how did the team get themselves back towards the top? It started with making changes from the top down. Zach Brown came in in late 2016, took one look at the team throughout the 2017 season and decided there and then that things needed to change. So he ripped up the rule book and started putting a plan of action into place. Honda out and Renault in for the 2018 season. Fernando Alonso and Stoffel van Dorn would survive the switch over initially, picking up points here and there for the team, but it wasn't enough and come 2019, the McLaren team would have a real shakeup on its hands. The trio that would signal the start of the rebuild would come to fruition. Andreas Seider would step in as the team principal. Two-time world champion Fernando Alonso would be replaced by another Spaniard in Carlos Sainz and Ricky Lando Norris would take a seat alongside him. It wasn't a guaranteed success in the making by any means. In fact, these changes were met with raised eyebrows. This was the first time that McLaren didn't have a world champion amongst its drivers since 2006 and Kimi would go on to win one in 2007. They had always gone big with their driver acquisitions. To go for Sainz as your number one who had just come 10th on loan with Renault from Red Bull during the 2018 season season, only his fourth season in Formula One was a huge statement. Carlos didn't even have a podium to his name, let alone a championship, whilst Lando had his first ever season in Formula One. He had only been in a Formula One car for test sessions and missed out on winning the Formula Two championship to Williams driver George Russell. McLaren had gone all in. Thankfully for McLaren though, the 2019 season was much more positive. Carlos Sainz recorded the team's first podium since 2014, with the team securely establishing themselves as the fourth fastest constructor instructor behind Mercedes, Ferrari and Red Bull. 2020 would see them build on this and actually pick up third in the constructor's standings. It was all looking up and it seemed like McLaren were only headed towards the top. And if you ask many people in 2021, which of McLaren, Alpine and Aston Martin would be battling for wins come the big regulation changes in 2022 and 2023, they would have been silly not to go for McLaren. So what's gone so wrong? How have Aston Martin seemingly jumped the queue into the top spots and left the likes of McLaren so far behind? How have they gone from rebuilding seemingly so well four or five years ago to being a team that missed out every single year, sliding down the constructor standings third to fourth to fifth, and it would be not a surprise to me if they finished in sixth or lower this season. Let's take the season opener in Bahrain in isolation, as Saudi Arabia saw both cars damaged and therefore it's difficult to judge that race in the same way. Oscar, during his first stint in Bahrain, was putting in a strong start to his Formula One career, keeping in and around the likes of Sargent and Ocon, whilst Lando without issues would probably have ended up finishing in the points in and around the likes of Gasly and Albon. If he didn't have those reliability problems, if we look at the pace he had at the end of the Grand Prix when he was running behind Lewis Hamilton in a Mercedes, he didn't seem to be having too much of a hard time keeping pace with his fellow Brit. Taking into account that he was on the fresher tyres, of course, that maybe puts him in and around that middle of the pack. Which actually led to Andrea Stella coming out after the race incredibly positive. He said, I think in the race we also saw some reward of the work we did over the winter in trying to improve the interaction between the car and the tyres. This was certainly a strong position on Lando's side, but also Oscar actually having good degradation in the first stint, we overtook cars. It was a very tight race, so we could have been in the points with two cars. That's the most positive outcome of this event which in my opinion just makes the whole situation around the race even more frustrating and the whole situation around McLaren even more disappointing. Ricky Oscar Piastri's debut, whilst initially strong, only lasted 14 laps before an electrical failure would stop him from continuing and Lando Norris, although he would have been able to finish the Grand Prix, would have to visit the pit lane six separate times due to pneumatic issues and McLaren would just give up after so many mechanical failures in the end. We never got to see if the car would have actually been able to truly battle with the rest of the field at the latest 
later stages of those tyre stints. Don't get me wrong, I don't think the season is completely over for McLaren in any way, but I do feel like they won't be able to improve on last season, which considering they only had one driver who could actually get the car to work last year, is not where they would have wanted to be. They had an entire winter break to come good on these issues, both cars having major issues at the first race of the season after we have already had these regulations for a year is unacceptable. If you want to move towards the top of the grid, which they keep saying they're going to do, but haven't been able to actually prove it, what I think it has to truly come down to is the infrastructure behind the scenes. To me, it has been absolutely no surprise that Aston Martin have improved this year. Now, I was not expecting them to improve this much this quickly, but I did predict Aston Martin would be top of the midfield and come fourth in the constructor standings this year. My reasoning behind this was the new factory, a project that Aston Martin had focused their resources on for 2021 and 2022. The team had held back on upgrading the car and improving in that individual season because they knew they were thinking long term. Whilst McLaren have still been borrowing a wind tunnel and their own won't be finished until later this year, meaning the 2024 car will be the first year that they can actually benefit from that. They've also only just invested in a state-of-the-art simulator upgrade that has been needed for years. Basically, the team's financial instability has meant that they haven't been able to build on their accomplishments in previous years, whilst others have improved and innovated. And making the changes now almost feels a little too late. The car philosophy that they have has been described as almost undrivable by many incredibly experienced drivers. Sainz, Ricardo, and even Norris, who seems to be able to get pace out of it, still describes the car as horrible to drive, which is something they seemingly are unable to understand and address. They've shown that they can improve the car over the course of a season and build a competitive midfield car that can consistently battle for points, but I don't think they have a full grasp on how exactly they've done that. They cannot seem to take any of the aspects out of the car which make it so difficult to drive. This leads me to believe that Red Bull, Mercedes, Ferrari, Aston Martin, Alpine, and with Audi coming in soon too, there are six teams there that I already think are in a much better situation, not only now, but moving forwards in Formula One than McLaren. And that's why McLaren have looked at fast and completely changed the behind the scenes by getting rid of James Key. I don't think this has been a snap decision by the team at all, but something that the team would have debated over the entire winter break. They know they have a very difficult car to understand, but they gave James the winter break to to try and get on top of it, and he clearly hasn't. Stella has been evaluating the team's technical structure. Brown even admitted, it has been clear to me for some time that our technical development has not moved at a quick enough pace. So McLaren needed a shakeup. James Key out and three incredibly experienced heads in Formula One come in. Peter Prodromo will look into aerodynamics, David Sanchez from Ferrari on car concept and performance, and finally Neil Holdy will head up design and engineering. Rather than a sole chief technical lead, I think this is an amazing step forward for McLaren the problem that they'll have is that this structure will take time to bed in and they're running out of time with one key figure, Lando Norris. Lando is already being linked out of the McLaren team, even though he has a contract until 2025. It's a horrible thought as a McLaren fan, but I can also completely understand why Lando may want to leave the team and sees himself at being able to achieve more elsewhere. The obvious links being Red Bull as a Sergio Perez replacement. If Perez doesn't meet the standards of that team, he could easily go in and get wins. Or of course, Sauber that is set to be Audi as then he'd be following in the footsteps of his old team principal, Andreas Seidel, and could easily become the clear number one driver in that team when it becomes Audi. Audi in 2026. But beyond that, there's the possibility of being a Hamilton or Alonso replacement if either retire anytime soon. Honestly, after the last two seasons, Lando has put himself in the shop window for basically any team looking for an exceptional talent that is still quite young, which means that McLaren really needs to step up their game if he's going to be convinced to stay in the long term. He deserves to be somewhere that he can actually be in a car that can win races. Overall, McLaren find themselves at a huge turning point. The benchmark has now been set by Aston Martin. The team have a new wind tunnel simulator and technical team on the way very very soon for me it's now or never at mclaren if they cannot step it up now it's going to be another generation of fluctuating around the midfield but that's just my thoughts and feelings i'd love to know how you think in the comments down below while you're down there leave a like on the video subscribe to the channel if you're new and i'll see you next time